Welcome brothers and sisters to our brand new class of Ephesians chapter 5, Life in the Spirit. And will we be continuing where we left off last week, which is verse 18 of chapter 5. So we're on section B right now, walking in light. And as if you can recall, we, were, we stopped on verse 18. Why? And if you can remember it, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled of the Holy Spirit. And I was telling you last week that it's important for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we're, we're, we, saw, we saw this last week. Uh, it's a constant filling that we need to go through, right? Be filled with the Holy Spirit is not one time thing, but it should be a constant filling. We need that baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that should be a, a valid and important experience for all of us. If you haven't experienced the Holy Spirit yet, let me tell you, experience it. Seek the Holy Spirit while He can be, still be found. Seek Him. And if you do, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that your life will be different. I guarantee you. So, let's get, let's get on with it. There is a wonderful and, 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 and significant first experience with the filling of the Holy Spirit, often thought as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We saw this last week, and we saw this in Matthew 3.11, Acts 1.5, and, uh, and um, Acts 11 and 16. And now if you can remember the, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, remember the day of Pentecost and how it was, and how it just came as a strong wind, and tongues like fire were on top. I don't know if you can imagine this, but I can. Remember the light? Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we heard some lightning, right? Two weeks ago, we were hearing lightning. And, and li uh, not hearing it, seeing lightning, seeing the flashes, but hearing the thunder and how it rumbled and how it shook the earth. Imagine that strong wind sounding like that. Overpowering. Something powerful that just came down on the disciples, on the 120 that were in the upper room. Now imagine what God can do for us if, if we just, all of us seek the Holy Spirit, if He just came down. And I, I'm going to use this word and surprised us. And all of us just. Or in a, start speaking in tongues and, and in the blessings and and I can't I can't even describe it, but ima imagine and let's let's envision it. Why not, as a church, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So, let us continue. Much of the weakness, defeat, and lethar lethargy, lethargy. Lethargy? lethargy? Lethargy, yes. I had it right the first time. <laughs> lethargy in our spiritual life can, can be attributed to the fact that we are not constantly be, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to that. Much of our weaknesses, defeats, lethargies, tribulations, problems, whatever, is attributed to the fact that we lack a spiritual life. That we lack a constant feeling of the Holy Spirit. So, if your life is upside down, if your life is going downhill, and you know who Christ is, and you know what He did for you, then something is wrong. We need a catalyst. In other words, we need a changing factor. And what is that? The Holy Spirit. If you can remember, remember when Jesus ascended up to heaven, he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send down the comforter. And he's going to guide you to all truth and all righteousness. So, if we don't have that help, how are we going to survive? If we don't have that person, that that factor, that that catalyst, that person to guide us, then we're not going to survive. 
So much of that defeats and weaknesses are attributed to the fact that we lack spiritual life. That's why everything goes wrong in our life. But there's one way to change that. Amen? The ancient Greek grammar for be, be filled also indicates two important things. Right? Two important things. First, the verb is passive. So this is not a, manuf a manufactured experience. First, the verb is passive. Let's remember that. So it's not a manufacturer experience. Second, it is also imperative. So this is not an optional imperative. imperative. Sorry, sorry. God bless Brother Jorge. He's always, he's always helping me read the words correctly. As you may know, I think in Spanish. So I just read it. But it's, it's imperative. Imperative. Fun fact. <laughs> So it's not an optional experience. So what does that mean exactly? That this experience that, that, it, that is not fixed and is not optional either. It's either you go or you don't. Right? It's either you do or you don't. That's basically it. Nobody's manufacturing this. Nobody's like fixing this. And it's not your choice. It's not optional. It's either it happens or it doesn't. Right? So, do not be drunk with wine. The carnal contrast to being filled with the Holy Spirit is being drunk. The Bible condemns drunkenness without reservation. There's a lot of people out there that think that drinking wine for a Christian is Okay, now, if you drink wine, and there's a, there, there's a lot of cultures, and, and there's cultures that drink wine at, at a regular basis. You know, a lot of South American countries drink wine. And it's normal to them because they're instructed, that's their culture. Now, if, if someone wants to leave the drinking wine, then okay, that's, that's them. But in some cultures, if, if, if we need to understand this, some cultures, they do drink wine. And in fact, they say that it, drinking wine is, it is good for, for your body for your, for, uh, to clean it, right? Digestion. For, di for a di digestion system. So, it, it, we need to come to an understanding. But, remember, during Jesus' time, Drinking wine was a cultural thing, but it wasn't tempered with. That wine wasn't tempered. Okay? It wasn't. Now, this wine is. So, but the Bible condemns it. Okay? The Bible condemns it. Do not drink excessively. All right? In which is dissipation. Paul says that drunkenness is dissipation. This means that drunkenness is a waste of resources that should be submitted to Jesus. Now, what he's saying here is that that waste of resources, they're, they're your weaknesses, your problems, your stresses, your worries. Those are wastes of resources. Those, all of those things should be submitted to God. Plain and simple. Submit them. Give them up. Why are you holding to your past? Why do you keep holding on to your problem, to your stress? Why do you hold on to a tribulation? Why do you hold on to a regret? Right? I mean... They're, 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 that's a waste. That's, that's a waste on you. That's trash that you're carrying from your past. So you need to submit them to Jesus. John Trapp writes of drinking all the three outs. That is, Ollie out of the pot. Yeah. Ale out of the pot. See, see. 
See, if if this was Spanish, I would be like in the back. <laughs> <laughs> but God bless brother Jorge. He's always here to help me out. Money out of the purse and wit out of the head. That's the all three outs. And that is his commentary on Galatians 5.21. And if you have the chance, go and, and read Galatians 5.21. But Ali out of the pot. Ale out of the pot, sorry. Ale out of the pot, money out of the purse and wit out of the head. Those are the three outs. Next week, I'll, I'll tell you what ale means. <laughs> I, <laughs> but it's a waste, basically. Basically, everything is a waste when you are drinking, right? Why? Let's just take money out of the purse. You waste money. All your money goes away by drinking. And second, your wit. You're not there once you become drunk, right? So you're basically not there. So the Bible condemns this. The Bible condemns drunkenness. Amen. So we should listen to what Proverbs tells us about drunkenness in the passage, such as Proverbs 20, 20 verse 1 and 23, 29 to 33. Write those down, please. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some time to write them down. Did you write them down? Okay, good. So, that's what the Bible says about drunkenness. I mean, if, if, God, if God got you out of, of, of if you lived a life uh, of alcoholism, alcoholism for a very long time, you know what I'm talking about. You lose who you are. You lose basically your consciousness. Your senses are not there. You become disoriented. So the Bible condemns this. And those are one, those two are part of the scriptures that the Bible uses to describe this, the drunkenness. So we must not think that only the state of falling down drunk qualifies as sin. Again, let me read that again. We must not think that only the state of falling down drunk qualifies as sin. Being impaired in any way by drunk by, by, by drink is sin, as well as drinking with the intention of becoming impaired. Now, I'm going to read this one more time, but this applies to every single thing that you are, are addicted to or that if you've been struggling with the sin, that's exactly what it is. Now, if you're being impaired in any way by, dri by, by a drink is sin, as well as drinking with the intention. Now, if you have the intention to sin, then you're going to be impaired. If to drink is to sin, having the intention to do that is still a sin. Right? That's it. It's not, one thing is to do it, but the other thing is the intention to. If you didn't fall into temptation, if you were tempted and you fell, then you sinned. But if you thought about it, and you, did, and you didn't make the act, but you still thought about it, you still sinned. The intention is still there. Right? So that qualifies as a sin. Why? Because the Bible says that by only... Let, 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 let's, just, let, let's just put this at the... Put, uh, place this as the example. I, 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 I look at someone, I look at a sister, and I look at her in the wrong way. And I thought about it. I already sinned. If I commit the act, I sinned. But if I look at her at a, at a bad way, in a, in a wrong way, I sinned. It's, it's either you, make, you commit the act or you have the intention. You still sinned. So that's what Paul is saying here. 
There's a lot, a, a, there's a lot, my brothers and sisters, a lot that we can get out of this simple verse. Word says, the danger of drunkenness lies not only in itself, but in what it may induce. That's the danger of being drunk. What are you going to do after? We see this now with many, many drunk people, many, many people uh, under the influence have taken away lives or have taken their own life or have hurt someone. You know, what's the aftermath of you being under the influence of alcohol, right? Practically, the world pays a high price for the ruin of alcoholism and drug addiction. That's a fact. That's truly a fact. The world has paid a high price. And now that marijuana is now legal? I don't know if they're paying a high price anymore, but a lot of, a lot of people are basically losing themselves. Right? To speak of alcohol alone, according to the United States Center of Disease Control, in 2010, 88,000 people died of alcohol-related causes in the U.S. And excessive drinking cost the U.S. economy $249 billion dollars among a quarter of a trillion dollars. It is fair to suppose that the figures are uh, comparable, if not worse, in many other nations. That's something to think about, my brothers and sisters. That's just 2010. Now, if we do this same study 11 years after, Let's see if that statistic is still the same or it has gone worse. So that's just 2010. Think about 2021, right? But be filled with the Spirit. Paul contrasted the effect of the Holy Spirit with the state of drunkenness. Alcohol is a depressant. It loosens people because it depresses the self-control, their wisdom, their balance, and judgment. That's what alcohol does. Basically, basically loosens you up. You lose your self-control, your senses, where everything is. You lose your balance. And you lose your judgment. That's what basically it what, what basically does. Now the Holy Spirit has an exactly opposite effect. The Holy Spirit is a stimulant. He moves every aspect of your being to better and more perfect performance. So, if we go back to the, to the slide, to the, to the previous slide, if alcohol is not depressant and it loosens you up, the Holy Spirit tightens you up. It allows you to have more self-control, to have more wisdom, to have a better balance be in your life and to have a better judgment. That's what basically the Holy Spirit does. It's a stimulant. It's making every aspect of your life better so you can perform better. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Mo says this, we find it we find it here embedded amongst precepts, laying down with great laws of self-control. And it comes just before the special directions what the Apostle gives for the quiet sanctities of the Christian home. But then, all the while, it is a, it is a thing supernatural. It is a state of man wholly unattainable by training, by reasoning, by human wish and will. It is nothing less than God in command and control of, of man's whole life, flowing with everywhere into it, and he may flow fully and freely out of its in effects, uh, out of in, in, 
it it in effects around i like that 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 part right there because that's what god does when god is in complete command and takes control of man's whole life he will just flow everywhere flow in every area of your life he will be flowing and flowing and flowing and he will flow freely and the effects of that overflow of, of, of that filling that he will give you through the holy spirit you won't even notice amen so that 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 is that is the mo that is very important for us to understand that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let us go into verses 19 and 20, right? And, and the word says this, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit-filled life is marked by worship and gratitude. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will have a desire to worship God and to encourage others to worship, to their worship of God. That's what the Spirit does. It's contagious, in other words. The connection of being filled with the, with the Spirit and, and, and praise is significant. Those who are filled with the Spirit will naturally praise. And praise is a way that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's another way. Pray, shout praises, sing to the Lord. That's another way that, the Holy, that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Psalms, and hy Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This variety, this variety suggests that God delights in creativity, spontaneous worship. I can't say no to that one. He delights in worship because He is worthy to be praised. The most important place for us to have a melody unto God is in our hearts. Many who... who can't sing a beautiful melody with a vo with their voice can have a beautiful melodies in their hearts and i would love to and i'm going to stop right here i'm just going to stop right here because this is an important i believe that this is a the best place to, to stop for this class for today the most important place for us to have a melody it's in our own hearts now you may look at me Okay, I do not have the best voice. I can't sing whatsoever. Plain and simple, I said it, I can't take it back. <laughs> but you see me worshiping God through a language that I have nurtured, that I have trained for many years, and that language is music. Whether um, I'm hitting the, a tom or, or, or hitting the cymbal or playing a chord on the piano or on the bass. Every single melody, every single note comes out of my heart to God. Maybe you don't have uh, uh, the musical ability or maybe you don't have the great voice. But you do have a beautiful melody in your heart. Let no one tell you that. That you don't have a, a melody. That you don't have that, that in your heart. Everybody needs to praise. The best praises come from your heart. That is the most important thing that I can say. It's not because I'm a musician. No. A musician only worries about their instrument and their craft. A worshiper worships whether he has an instrument in his hand, whether he has a vo whether he has a good voice, or whether he doesn't have a musical ability or a good voice. A worshiper gives and submits all to God. And the next time you are at church, 
Give it all to God. Give your best melody that you have. That's a challenge. I want to challenge you to give this Sunday, this Sunday that we're, we're, we're going to be in service, give the best praise that you got in your heart. Amen? So that's a challenge for me to you. So, with that being said, I'm not, I, I would like to thank you for this time. Thank you for, for joining me here, for joining us. Uh, Brother Jorge, he's in, he's in the back, uh, always ha handling the, the computer, the controls. Thank you, and always helping me in, in my English as well. Uh, some words that I, <laughs> that I, can't, that I can't pronounce. You know, Spanish. I'm always thinking in Spanish. But I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. And don't forget, I challenge you to give the best praise that you got for God. Whether it is at your home or at church this Sunday, please give the best melody that you have for God. Don't forget that we have a women to women chat this week at 7 at, on Friday. And don't forget that we also have our 9 o'clock class with Sister Rachel in person. And also, we have our service at 10 o'clock in person and also via live stream. So, with that being said, thank you for, for joining us here today. And stay tuned for any uh, any other event. that uh, Any other event. Stay tuned for, for everything on our, fa on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. With that being said, thank you. And may God bless you and I'll see you here next week.